apologetics, and current events. From the housetops, coming up next. Joseph Kung, founder and director of the Cardinal Kung Foundation, passed away peacefully at his home in Stanford, Connecticut, on February 14, 2023. The 90-year-old native of China was an ardent advocate for the persecuted underground Roman Catholic Church in that country. He was the nephew of the late Ignatius Cardinal Kung, who endured over 30 years imprisonment by the Chinese Communist government. Joseph Kung was born in Shanghai in 1933, the second of eight children of Dr. Vincent and Teresa Kung. In 1950, at the age of 18, soon after the Communists took over China, he left Shanghai to be reunited with his father, who had fled to Hong Kong months earlier. As the border closed soon after, he could not see his mother and siblings again for almost 30 years. His father died two years later, leaving him penniless and alone. Joseph and his family remained always grateful to the Shanghainese family friends who assisted him during this time. Through persistent efforts and prayer, Joseph was able to receive one of the few 2,000 visas granted to Chinese refugees in the early 1950s. He relocated in 1955 to Ohio, where he enrolled at John Carroll University to begin his undergraduate studies. He worked full-time throughout his entire four years to put himself through school, graduating in 1959. He continued his education, culminating with two MBAs from Case Western Reserve University and Wayne State University. He was a certified public accountant by trade. Eventually, Joseph returned to Hong Kong, where he married his wife, Agnes, in 1968. They were blessed with the birth of four children— a lifelong fervent American patriot, Joseph was always grateful to the United States for his many opportunities, including the relocation of his young family to Stanford in 1979. Kung's life was one of deep faith, love of family, and courage in the defense of the religious freedom denied to Roman Catholics in China. Overcoming all obstacles, Joseph had the joy of facilitating the immigration of his mother and six siblings, along with their immediate families, to the United States. Perhaps his greatest accomplishment was his keeping alive the memory of his uncle, then bishop, and later Cardinal Ignatius Kung. Joseph testified before Congress on multiple occasions and finally convinced 54 members of Congress to sign a letter to China's premier pleading for Cardinal Kung's release. In 1987, he successfully obtained the Cardinal's freedom after 32 years of incarceration in China. The Cardinal took up residence with his nephew in Stanford and died there on March 12, 2000. The Cardinal Kung Foundation, established in 1992, not only continues to support the persecuted Roman Catholic Church in China, but also champions the cause of Cardinal Kung's canonization. To this day, countless persecuted underground Catholic clergy, religious, and laity are the grateful beneficiaries of the wonderful work accomplished due to the steadfast loyalty of Joseph Kung. For more information about the Cardinal Kung Foundation, visit cardinalkungfoundation.org. Coming up next, Joseph Kung's funeral homily by the Rev. James McCurry, given on Saturday, February 25, 2023, at the Basilica of St. John the Evangelist in Stanford. Eternal rest grant to him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. May the soul of Joseph Kung and all the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. My thanks to Agnes and the Kung family for asking me to preach the homily at today's Requiem Mass for Joseph Kung, and my sincere appreciation as well to Father Cyprian La Pastina, the pastor of this beautiful Basilica of St. John the Evangelist, for according me this privilege. In the sacred scriptures, there stand out two extraordinary men with the name of Joseph. These two Josephs tower strong, unique, and indispensable to God's plan of salvation. One in the Old Testament, Joseph, son of Jacob. One in the New Testament, Joseph, husband of Mary and foster father of Jesus Christ. 
Both biblical Josephs were refugees, forced to leave their homelands, exiles to Egypt and other terrains. Both were chosen by God to safeguard their families. The twelve tribes of Israel in the Old Testament and the Holy Family in the New Testament. God used these two just men of faith, Joseph son of Jacob and Saint Joseph of Nazareth, as protectors of his covenant and instruments for upbuilding the covenant people of God, the Church. The biblical figure of the wandering Aramean from Deuteronomy 26.5 aptly describes this whole family of these two Josephs of the scriptures. The quote, my father was a wandering Aramean who went down into Egypt and sojourned there. The role of these two Josephs as just men of principle and integrity was absolutely essential in God's plan of salvation. Now, may I make bold to suggest that our Joseph Kung, as a modern-day wandering Aramean, mirrored the pattern of his two biblical namesakes, a refugee from Shanghai to Hong Kong to America, our Chinese Joseph exemplified lifelong and unshakable faith which grounded each step on his incredible journey. If there's one principle above all which link Joseph Kung to Joseph son of Jacob and Joseph spouse of Mary, it was the Catholic cardinal virtue of justice, the rendering to every person what is due, giving everyone equal status and fair share. Joseph Kung's passion for justice manifested itself, of course, most brilliantly in his unflagging labor for the persecuted underground Catholic Church in China. The Kung family especially its holy uncle, Ignatius Cardinal Pin Mei Kung, lived through pain, suffering, persecution, torture, misunderstanding, calumny, and exile, all for the love of the one true, holy, Catholic, apostolic church in China. The more the false Catholicism of the state dictated patriotic church spread its disinformation and dictatorship, all the more did Joseph Kung fight the good fight for truth and justice. Our Joseph the Just believed what the angel proclaimed to Our Lady, nothing is impossible to God. Joseph the Just never accepted no for an answer. The presence of Joseph's siblings here today is a living testimony to Joseph's conviction that nothing is impossible to God. As the eldest son in a large family, Joseph Kung became the second father to his brothers and sisters after the untimely death of their father the famous surgeon who himself lived in the exile of Hong Kong across the sealed border from China. And like his biblical prototype, Joseph Kung worked tirelessly for decades, even writing letters over and over again to President Kennedy and other political leaders in order to bring his family members from lives of persecution, imprisonment, poverty and tribulation to America, the land of freedom and opportunity. One by one, to each of his beloved siblings and family members, he would welcome them to America, echoing the words of the Old Testament 
patriarch. I am Joseph, your brother. Today's first reading at Mass from the Book of Wisdom speaks about the souls of the just, likening them to gold in the furnace. The key here is that just souls understand truth. We ask God today then in our prayers for the soul of Joseph Kung that our Almighty Father recognize and reward Joe for those sacred principles of justice and truth which the refiner's fire kept purifying in him throughout his life. Today's second reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans gives us further insight into God's plan for using just ones like Joseph Kung in the task of upbuilding the church. This task is a life and death struggle, life and death struggle. Men and women of the underground Catholic tradition like Joseph Kuhn understand what it means to be buried with Christ, baptized into Christ's death, and never, never losing sight of the resurrection, where justice and truth will never be overpowered. We'll be back with more from the housetops after this break. Tim Kilcoyne, WQPH Radio 89.3 FM, offering a Lenten reflection that I hope will be practical and represent your needs, not your necessary desires. I'm reminded of a book called Three Irish Saints, St. Brendan, St. Patrick, and St. Bridget. St. Brendan was noted for being a thinker, St. Patrick a doer, and St. Bridget a lover. Now think, what must you do to balance and integrate all three of those charisms? You could go visit a monastery, sit still before the Blessed Sacrament, take some time out with a good book before Jesus. You could visit that nursing home. Maybe a grandmother or an old aunt is still there waiting. And a little casual catechesis with an old friend that needs to discover the Catholic faith. Try any one of the three or all of them. God bless you. On the WQPH 89.3 FM Community Calendar, a special bit of Lent events at 118 Teresa Street, the old Madonna of the Holy Rosary Church. Of course, they'll still be having the fish fry that they have every year from 4.30 to 7, $12 for a full meal, $5 for either chowder or mac and cheese. But there will also be special religious events at Madonna. It will start Fridays at 9 a.m. to 2.45 p.m. with the Exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. There'll be a Mass at 3 o'clock, followed by the Stations of the Cross at 3.30, and then at 4.30, the meal starts serving. Again, that's all at the Madonna of the Holy Rosary Church, 118 Teresa Street in Fitchburg. Blessed Sacrament, 9 to 2.45, Mass at 3, Stations at 3.30, and then the Fish Fry from 4.30 to 7, $12 for a full meal, $5 for mac and cheese or chowder. This has been a WQPH 89.3 FM community calendar. Hello, this is Kendra Von Esch, a recovered corporate executive who left it all behind to help bring others to a deeper relationship with God and the beautiful Catholic faith. Here is my reflection for today. Confession. Whoa, that's a biggie, isn't it? Let me just say, God does not want us or need us to come to Him with our ducks in a row to ask for His forgiveness and mercy. When I went to confession on Divine Mercy Sunday in 2013, it was only my second Sunday back at Mass after being away for decades. I wasn't even a priester. You know those people who go to Mass on Christmas and Easter? I wasn't doing anything. But when I heard the announcements on the previous Sunday about confession being offered, it was the first time I really thought about my mortality. If I believe a half of a half of a half of a mustard seed of this Catholic faith, I am going to hell. I had many mortal sins on my soul and some that I didn't even know were mortal sins at the time. I didn't know about the examination of conscience. I just pulled out an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and started writing. I filled out both sides and I was scared to death when I walked in and knelt down to begin my confession. I actually said, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Get a load of this. It's been 26 years since my last confession. 
trying to make a joke out of the fact that it had been such a long time. And the priest responded with a soft-spoken, welcome home. Oh, and then I lost it. I started bawling like a baby. And then when the priest absolved me of my sins, I had an out-of-body experience and this supernatural peace was flowing over me like a warm waterfall. I floated out of that church. I don't know how I got to my car. My body was buzzing with this supernatural joy and now I go to confession weekly. So remember, when we fall, and we will fall, we need to go back to God right away. He loves us just as we are. We are his beloved children, and he wants us in our brokenness. So run to confession. It's so beautiful. For more inspiration, free downloads, and resources, check out KendraVonash.com. Have a blessed and inspired day. You know, we don't get excited about movies where well, where Clint Eastwood puts his gun back in his holster and says, look, I'm really sorry to shoot all those bullets, you know, have at me. You know, so we're, we don't live in that culture. The good guy's got to be a tough guy. How different is meekness, you know, in the way that the Bible teaches us? The Bible celebrates meekness. The biblical worldview says last is first. Giving is receiving. Dying is living. Losing is finding. The least is the greatest. Meekness is a strength. The idea is that we are living God's truth, not by what our culture says should make us happy. And that comes from Christianity.com. And I thought that was a really nice paragraph to share. Well, I attempted to give a quiz question to our audience uh, is to look up Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. It puts the cherry on top of what you just said, Dan, that Moses, he's the, he's the leader of the Israelites. Got the Ten Commandments for crying out loud. Yeah. And yet in that verse, in cha- chapter and verse, you'll see Moses is the meekest man on earth, the meekest person on earth. The 13th Apostle with Dan Duddy and Tom Caffrey every Saturday morning at 1130 on WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchburg. The church's quest for justice became the yoke which God fitted to the shoulders of the wandering Aramean, Joseph Kuhn. In today's gospel, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are burdened. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. Most interestingly, the original Greek word for easy in this passage is krestos. And it actually means well-fitting. Think for a moment of the carpenter's shop of St. Joseph in Nazareth. St. Joseph would have been making wooden yokes for oxen, and each yoke would need to be well fitted to a different sized neck. No two necks the same, no two oxen the same. And so too, God fits each yoke to the person of every single one of us. And God fitted to Joseph Kung the perfect yoke by which God could use this brilliant, stubborn, hard-working ox of a man for the incredible labor of upbuilding and safeguarding the church. Most of you know that Joe was a great aficionado of classical music. In a sense, his ox-like persistence in supporting the thousands of persecuted Chinese underground Catholics bespoke the orderly movements of a symphony. The fast allegro, the slow adagio, the delicate dance of scherzo, all aimed towards a final rondo, a final round of order that partakes of the heavenly kingdom. And like the composer of a symphony, Joseph Kung had a plan inspired by God. Despite all the opposition he faced, Joseph never abandoned that plan of hope, the work of the Cardinal Kung Foundation for the underground Catholics of China. Defeat would never be an option. Joe knew that his plan would ultimately succeed, and this is his legacy. 
Did you know that the name Kung, when written in its Chinese characters, has the image of a dragon embedded? In Chinese culture, the figure of the dragon is actually an icon of goodness, just the opposite of what the Western mind imagines. In the folklore of China, dragons symbolize something that is potentially powerfully beautiful. Wisdom, good fortune, strength, and almighty power over the forces of nature and history. In the two parts comprising the Chinese pictogram for the name Kung, the top part is a dragon. The bottom part, however, means union or together, a character that is now often associated with the concept of communism. So there you have it. The very name Kung depicts in Chinese a picture of the powerful victory of the good dragon over the communists. Joseph Kung loved his family name, and for a lifetime he embodied all of its symbolism. Joseph Kung was himself the good dragon. Now, every good dragon needs a good dragoness. For 54 years since they met in Hong Kong, and were engaged in the chapel of the bishop, who later married them, Agnes Young and Joseph Kung were a match made in heaven. We all pay tribute today to Agnes, not only for the heroic way in which you cared for Joe since his stroke six years ago, but for the lifetime of marital love that you and he shared with your children, your friends, and truly the whole world, Catholic marital love. You made the Kung home a place of great joy and welcome. Agnes Joe loved your sense of humor, as do we all. You imbued Joe's life with distinct and sometimes humorous insights into Chinese culture that he would not otherwise have known. Your Chinese humor would often bring a smile to Joe's face. Oh, how we loved Joe's smile. And one example that you taught Joe was that Chinese people could not have been responsible for original sin. With a straight face, you produced for Joe the evidence that Adam could not have been of Chinese origin. Said Agnes to Joseph, apples are common, snakes are a delicacy. <laughs> Thus, a Chinese Adam would have eaten the snake, not the apple. <laughs> we all know of Joseph Kung's profound devotion to Our Lady of Shishan, the National Madonna of China, whose sanctuary stands on a hill outside his native city of Shanghai. When Joseph returned to China for the last time to escort his beloved uncle, Cardinal Ignatius Pin Mei Kung from imprisonment to his exile in America here to Stamford. When Joseph returned that last time to China, the pair of them, uncle and nephew, went to the shrine of Our Lady of Shishan, and there the Cardinal celebrated a private mass behind locked doors. The statue of Our Lady of Shishan, which stands high above the main altar in that basilica has a unique posture. Our Lady is standing with her arms raised as she holds the Christ child on her head and presents him to the world with his arms outstretched both in blessing and embrace. The distinctive posture of Our Lady of Shishan bespeaks the Chinese symbology of Fu meaning good fortune or good luck. And it is the graced good fortune of Joseph Kuhn that today, inside his coffin, on his shoulder, rests a very special statue of Our Lady of Shishan, carved of olive wood in the Holy Land. It accompanies him 
to his rest. And this is our prayer today. O Holy Mother of us poor banished children of Eve, Our Lady of Shishan, please accompany Joseph Kung to paradise. May Joseph, the wandering Aramean, find rest from exile, reward for justice, victory of goodness, and peace eternal for the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The following are excerpts from Joseph Kung's testimony before the House of Representatives International Subcommittee on Global Human Rights, April 19, 2006. The Chinese government has repeatedly declared to the world that there is religious freedom in China. They also declared that this freedom is guaranteed by its constitution. However, all of the approximately 45 underground bishops in China are either arrested and now in jail, or under house arrest, or under strict surveillance, or in hiding, or on the run, or simply have disappeared. Bishop Su has spent approximately 30 years in prison thus far. He was once beaten so savagely in prison, and he suffered extensive hearing loss. Priests, seminarians, nuns, and a layperson face similar harassment. We know for sure there are approximately 25 of them in jail or in labor camps. This list is by no means complete because of the difficulties in obtaining details. Many cases are simply not reported here. My educated guess is that there must be hundreds in jail. The Chinese government has been trying to, to force the underground faithful to join and register with the official patriotic church since 1957 without much success. Now they are doing it with a new vigor. Those who refuse to join and register with the official patriotic church are now liable to be put in labor camp for three years. So it is now also a crime punishable by three years in labor camp when a person is ordained as an underground Roman Catholic priest and conducts evangelization without permission from the Chinese government. We need to examine carefully the labels when we make a purchase. The small savings you receive from buying something made in China actually indirectly strengthen a government that persecutes its own citizen. This is my summary of views. Because of time constraint, uh, I cannot do, say everything here. I have another document for my prepared statements that I request to be included in the hearing record for its entirety. From the House Stops is produced by the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Still River, Massachusetts.